Did you know that you can use generative AI directly in Photoshop? If you use Photoshop on a regular basis, this is not news to you. If you don't use Photoshop on a regular basis, you might not know about this. But also, um, you might not care because <laughs> you don't use Photoshop. Either way, stick around because this is not just a tutorial. There's a, there's a bigger point to this. But in the 2024 update to Photoshop, they included several uh, generative AI tools like Generative Fill, where if you select a part of a photo and then tell it what you want it to put there, it just puts it there. That and Generative Expand that lets you expand out from your subject and it just fills in what's around them. It's not perfect and sometimes it makes weird choices, but it kind of works like ChatGPT by just sort of like how ChatGPT just predicts what the next word should be. This just sort of predicts what should be there based off of what it sees around the edges of the images. And I use this a lot in making my thumbnails and stuff, so I got curious, like what would happen if you did that generative expand thing over and over and over again? Like, like, like what if you did it a hundred times? How many times would it take before things started to get weird? The answer, not very many. Oh man. So I should start by saying that I am not a Photoshop expert by any means, but I have used it a lot over the years. Like I worked as a copywriter in advertising uh, for about 15 years. Uh, and obviously I was not a designer, I was a copywriter, but I worked with designers and there was a lot of mocking up stuff in Photoshop that way. I've also made thumbnails for over 800 videos on this channel. Yes, I have done over 800 videos on this channel. And by the way, each video I do a few different thumbnails, so it's well into the thousands at this point. I would say on a scale of one to 10, I'm maybe a six, maybe a seven in, in Photoshop skills. Um, I'm, I'm good enough to mock up ideas, but then if I want it to look, really look good, I send it to an actual designer. But what I've easily spent most of my time on Photoshop doing is making thumbnails for these videos. And all videos for thumbnails are 16 by nine, kind of like what you're looking at right here. And vertical photos are the bane of my existence. So here's what I mean by this. Let's just say you find the perfect image, but it's not 16 by nine. So the first thing you gotta do is create a little template. It's a 16 by nine template. And then you have to pull this out, drop it in. This is what I had to do about five years ago. So you had two options here. One is you scale it way up so that it fills the entire width. And then you have to just sort of frame it however is best for that frame, but you don't get to see the entire thing. This is especially bad when you're doing, you know, people with their faces and stuff like that. Or you can scale it to about, you know, the right size, but then you got to fill in these things on the side. Now again, like just five years ago, the best option that you had here would be to do something like select the stamp tool. And that's where you uh, select something right there and then you paint over to the side and it just basically covers what was there in that little stamp that you did. This is very beginner uh, Photoshop stuff. As you can see, you can only do a little bit at a time and it's, it's, uh, it's very time consuming. Now, just a few years ago, they introduced something called content aware fill. And what you would do there is you would select the area that you need to fill in and then you hit content aware fill and it would basically fill it in with whatever is closest. You can see where it's green right there. It would kind of show you what it's pulling from. And uh, it's, it's fair to say that it, it wasn't perfect, but it would fill it in with something. For some reason, this, this <laughs> stable background became bricks in its estimation. But now with the 2024 model, they have this generative expand tool and it's so freaking simple. You hit the crop tool and then you come down here into this little bar that they've created Select 16 by nine, so it creates the size that you want, and then just expand it out to the size that you want it to, to be. You create the space that it needs to fill in, and then uh, you just select Generate. And you got a little task tool up here. It takes a second for it to, to load up, but look at what happens. It's done. It's almost, I mean, unless you're really looking for it, you cannot hardly even tell that there was anything changed to it. It does give you a few different options to choose from here, uh, but usually, usually one of them works perfectly. So here's another example of how I used one of these. I did a video a while back on uh, how they're bringing back the woolly mammoth, de-extincting animals, that kind of thing. Well, I found this photo uh, in the Adobe stock catalog. So again, I need to make this 16 by nine. So you go to crop, hit 16 by nine in the ratio. Make it a little bit bigger so that it's the right size. Hit generate. And now you've got this background and it looks perfect, doesn't it? So I wanted to show that there's human beings in here with the mammoth. 
So what I did was I select the marquee tool and just kind of, I want a person standing right here on this rock right here. So I just kind of did a little thing, kind of selected a little thing like that, created a space. Now you hit generative fill and you type in uh, a person looking up at the mammoth in cold weather clothing and hit generate. And there it is. You want a different person? You also got that person who's kind of growing out of the rock, which is weird. That might be my favorite. Look at that. It's magic. So like when we talk about AI being a tool, it's, it's kind of an abstract concept until you get to things like this. And, and it's just these very incredibly time-saving features that AI has brought in to tools that we've been using for a long time that are the real game changer to me. But seeing this at work got me thinking, like what if I took a picture of myself and did a generative expand on it? And then I expanded out from that, and then out from that, and out from that. What if I did that a hundred times? And then maybe I could stitch all that together like an infinite zoom thing. So I decided to give it a try. So I took a shot of myself, which you can see here, and I expanded it. And I decided to use the grid that the crop tool creates and made it so the size of the photo was the same as one of the cells created by the grid. That way all the expansions would be the same. I think it came out to about 300%. Did the generative expand and got this. Oh man. <laughs> it looks like the ceiling is melting. Look how long my arm is. I realized pretty quickly that if I just kept expanding the image over and over that the size of the image was going to become unsustainably large. So I reduced the image size back down to 4K resolution and then expanded it again. Oh, this is interesting. This is actually a lot more interesting than what I got yesterday. You see, now I'm in like a weird cave. <laughs> I should probably mention that I did all this on a live stream that I made available for members. So we got to hang out and chat while I did this. It took a few hours. Hit the join button down below if you want to be invited to my next weird idea. Anyway. Oh, we're coming out of the cave now. Wasn't expecting that. The expansion seemed to put me in a cave for some reason, or maybe something like a bomb shelter built into a cave. There may be a story behind this, but within maybe about five expansions, it took me out of the cave, and then we were just off across an endless landscape. So part of this little experiment was that I wanted to just let it be random. Uh, remember, it gives you three choices, and obviously whichever choice you choose will affect the next generation and so on and so on. So if I wanted to direct where it went, I could do so by picking a different choice, or for that matter, I could have just entered a text prompt to change it however I wanted. But I chose to just let randomness do its thing. For a while. Yeah, after about an hour and a half of this endless landscape that wasn't changing much, it just all kind of started to feel kind of samey. So I decided to nudge it a little bit to see if I could make it go in a different direction. And go in a different direction it did. Ooh, oh. <laughs> so how does this work? Without going into a whole deep dive on generative AI and how it works, because that's totally out of scope for this video and it's been covered a million times before, the first of these programs to really make some waves was DALI from OpenAI which was only just revealed in January of 2021. Yeah, believe it or not, this is only about three years old. But DALI was a revelation because it combined natural language processing with image generation, making it possible to just enter a text prompt and get a fully realized image out of it. It wasn't perfect, uh, especially with hands. It was notoriously bad with hands at first, but it was a proof of concept. Um, also, the original DALI wasn't really available to the public. It was more of a research project. DALI 2 made significant improvements to the original, and it was available to the public in April of 2024, followed soon after by Midjourney in July of that year and Stable Diffusion one month later in August. Yeah, I think someday we're going to look back on 2022 as the year when this all started happening. One of the big problems with these image generators was that they were basically trained on all the images on the internet, meaning artists, photographers, illustrators. They were all having their copyrighted work being used without their permission, which is still going on. 
But to add insult to injury, these same artists and photographers had to face the possibility of losing work because people can now just make whatever images they want instead of paying an artist to do it for them. But even more so, they stood to lose revenue they normally made by licensing their work to stock image libraries. Stock image sites have been a whole industry for a while now, for decades actually. They were used by designers and agencies to mock up campaigns and websites. And they were really one of the first industries in the chopping block once the generative AI art thing became a thing. And one of the largest stock libraries in the world was owned by Adobe itself. They stood to lose millions, maybe billions of dollars as people turned to these generative AI models. So in March of last year, Adobe introduced Firefly. So Firefly is Adobe's generative AI model. It works just like Dolly and Midjourney. The difference is that Firefly is only trained using the images in Adobe's stock catalog, which means Adobe already had the licensing rights to all these images. So it feels a bit more ethical because at least the artists got paid something for their work being used in training data. Now, I tried Firefly when it came out. Honestly, I was kind of underwhelmed by it compared to, say, Midjourney, who I still think has the best image quality. And apparently I'm not alone in that opinion because Firefly has never really taken off as a standalone image generator. But in 2024, Adobe incorporated Firefly into Photoshop. So yeah, these generative expand, these generative fill tools, that's Firefly. And as a tool inside of Photoshop, it's been a game changer and it's made possible all the things that I'm talking about in this video. Okay, so you know how I said I was maybe a six or a seven on Photoshop a second ago? I would give myself the same rating of proficiency when it comes to editing. I've done tons of editing, but yeah, I would still rate myself as only maybe a six or a seven. But when it comes to graphics and like effects and stuff like that, um, I'm maybe a three, as you're about to find out. So here's how I was hoping this would work. I was hoping that I could just use the scale function in Adobe Premiere and time it up just right, have it kind of just fade in from one picture to another and time the, the expansions just right so that all I would have to do is apply that to one clip and then I could just copy that property and apply it to all the other clips, line them up, Bob's your uncle. Um, turns out Bob was not my uncle. Because as you can see, this first one looks fine, but then the timing on the second one, I just couldn't quite get it right. I played with it and played with it, trying to make it work. And what it turns out the problem is, is that um, the velocity of scaling, the speed of the scaling changes depending on what percentage of scale the image is. Meaning an image that's expanding from say 30% to 50% is going to move a lot faster than when it's going from 200 to 250%. And that just made timing up those clips really difficult. I even came over here in the effects controls panel and was applying a, a curve to the scaling, um, trying to make it work right there. And as you can see, I played with this for like a couple of hours and I just never could quite get it right. Did I mention I'm about a three when it comes to graphics and effects? What I realized I need to do is to be able to move it in Z space. So if you know, know anything about um, editing and compositing and things like that, you got the X and the Y in the parameters that you see, but then there's like a depth, a Z space. And I figured if I could get the Z space lined up, that way I wouldn't be dealing with those weird velocity issues when it came to scaling. The problem is you can't really do that in Premiere. You need something like Adobe After Effects to do that. And if I'm maybe a six or a seven editor in Premiere, I am like a negative two editor when it comes to Adobe After Effects. I am not good at that. Luckily, I have a good friend named Mark who is good at that. So after I finally gave up on this, I handed it over to Mark and he did his thing in After Effects. So it turns out even using the Z space in After Effects wasn't quite as easy as I was hoping for. There was a lot of positioning the images to line up just right. So instead of just getting one clip right and then copying and pasting that property to all the others like I had hoped we'd be able to do, um, he actually had to painstakingly take each shot, line them up, adjust their timing, and do that one after another a hundred times. I owe him a few beers for this. And even then, he struggled to make the transitions as, as smooth as I was hoping for. It turns out that the expansions themselves kind of created a bit of a warp on the outside of the images that prevented it from lining up perfectly. So yeah, we, we still get a little bit of a stutter effect, which I'm, I wish we didn't have. But in the end, we came out of it with this.
Is my face all swirly now? So overall, I'm pretty happy with how this came out. Um, I would like for it to be smoother. That kind of wah, wah, wah effect isn't really what I was going for, but apparently, uh, you know, Mark did everything he could and it still kind of came out like that. So I think it's something in the, in the expansion itself. I don't know, maybe if I made the expansions a little bit smaller, it would be smoother. Um, I don't know, if any of you guys out there have a better idea, I'd love to hear it. But this was just an experiment. I wanted to see what would happen. Um, I would be interested in repeating it to see if it goes in different directions every time you do it. I did test this a little bit before I did that full live stream. I only did maybe like five to seven expansions. And that one got a lot more abstract. It was a lot weirder. So uh, I was actually kind of surprised when I was doing it and it just kind of gave me this infinite landscape forever because the first time I did it, it immediately went into just like weird shapes everywhere. So yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what would happen if I did it again, but uh, this took hours <laughs> of my time and of Mark's time. So I'm not sure I really want to go through all that again. But somebody did point me to an app uh, from a, a company called Video Leap that does this infinite zoom thing, apparently in a matter of minutes. So I downloaded it. Let's, uh, let's, let's check it out. So yeah, this is one of those AI apps that does all kinds of cool things, um, immediately replaces backgrounds, does before and afters, voice swaps, face swaps, that kind of thing. And right there in the middle, they got infinite zoom. All right, so I've uploaded the photo and um, you can write a description to have it do something specific, but uh, I'm just gonna let it do the random thing because I've been doing the random thing. So just hit continue here, I'm zooming out, let's go. <laughs> Okay, this one went a bit more cyberpunk. It even has music on it, that, didn't expect that. Okay, so that was clearly a lot faster than what I did with the Photoshop thing, um, but it also didn't go nearly as far. It only kind of goes back to a certain point and then zooms out, or zooms back. I do kind of wonder um, if I can make several of these, like take the last frame of this and make that the starting point for the next one and just let it zoom, uh, do that forever. Um, I'm not gonna do that now. All right, so the, the point of this whole video is basically to show how, um, you know, all these AI tools are meant to save time. And this is how AI is gonna enter our lives. You know, we, we think of this like technological singularity, this big event, this big thing that's just kinda gonna explode and happen. But, you know, I've been making the point for a while that the singularity is something we've been living in probably since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And these AI tools, this is how it's gonna happen, is it's sort of just integrating just piece by piece into programs and processes that we already use. But there are dangers in this though. I mean, there's the obvious dangers of the fact that you can just select a little circle and put a person into a photo or, you know, manipulate stuff in that way. But we've been doing that for a long time. Um, the problem that I see now is like, when you go through the, uh, the Adobe stock library, like most of the images in there are just AI generated images. Like the woolly mammoth photo that I was playing with earlier, that was an AI generated image. That was not a real photograph of a mammoth, obviously. But it, it gets me wondering, though, like if, if the Firefly model is training off of the Adobe stock image gallery, is it just training off of itself at this point? The great AI Ouroboros, if you will. But the point of all these AI tools is to increase productivity. And that was the, the point of Photoshop from the very beginning. Like, I'm not kidding. The, the ability to expand a vertical image to 16 by 9 at the push of a button has saved me countless hours of thumbnail editing. And I could use all the help I can get in the productivity space, which is why I bought this book, which I've never gotten around to reading. I mean, what could have possibly kept me from getting to all these pages, he says, gesturing wildly at everything. Yeah, I haven't developed the habit of reading a bunch of pages every day, which has kept me from getting to this book that's supposed to teach you how to build the habit of reading a bunch of pages every day. It's a vicious cycle. But I did find a way around this problem, and it's an app called Imprint. And look, I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about this app until they reached out to me, but I'm really glad they did because I actually really like this. It's one of the perks of doing what I do. Sometimes you actually have something really cool drop in your lap. So here's how it works. Imprint pulls insights from some of the most popular thinkers and authors today, and well, across all time actually, and distills the book's essential points into fun, interactive courses. Courses that you can take in less than five minutes. Think about all the times you spend mindlessly scrolling on your phone. You could be learning concepts that could change your life. 
like the concept of Atomic Habits, which is on here. And I learned all the key concepts in like 20 minutes over three days. And there's all kinds of other books in here on everything from Sleep with Matthew Walker and Building Wealth with Ramit Sethi, even The Art of War from Sun Tzu. They also have learning paths, depending on what you want to improve about yourself. Like I did the productivity path, and that's where I learned about Mel Robbins' five second rule, which is basically whenever you find yourself procrastinating or hesitating on something, just count backwards from five and then just do the thing you're procrastinating on. That sounds incredibly simple, but psychologically it gives you what they call activation energy, which kind of gives you the willpower to do the thing. It's a simple trick, but it works. And the reason that I remembered that is because imprint lessons are designed based on the science of learning. Meaning, each chapter is broken down and explained visually with graphics that bring the concept home. And then, at the end of it, it asks you questions to sort of reinforce what you just learned. Now, I especially like that the things that you learn on here are actionable, like things that you can actually apply to your life. But they also just have, you know, books on social issues and history if you just want to absorb the knowledge. Anyway, I've really been enjoying it, and I'm happy to put this out there for you guys. So just go to imprintapp.com slash joe-scott for a seven-day free trial and 20% off your subscription. Honestly, if you do that seven day trial, I think you'll be hooked by day three. Like, I, I liked it immediately. It's, it's, like a, it's like a cheat code to improving your life. So one more time, that's imprintapp.com slash joe-scott, or just click the link down in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would love to hear your opinions in the comments about the, the dangers of all this, and uh, maybe there's better ways of doing what I did here. Again, it was just kind of a big experiment. If this is your first time watching my channel, I invite you to watch this video right here uh, because Google thinks that that might be right up your alley. Or you can look at any of the videos in the sidebar if you're on your web browser. Give them a click, and if you enjoy them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos every Monday. But that's it for now. Uh, this is a very different kind of video. We'll be getting back to normal types of videos soon enough. But thank you guys so much for watching. Now go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.